Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Folks, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. We are joined again by two of, well, one very common guest, one somewhat occasional guest. Hi. Hi. That's Alex Salkin there, and we have Professor Peter Koch <laughs> Hello. down here at Villanova University. This is sure to be a, uh, a heated conversation for some, a contentious conversation for others. We're going to uh, wade into some, some of the moral and political waters of today, and we figured who, who better than the bioethicist uh, to sit around and, and talk about issues of, of life, abortion, euthanasia. And I, so I will, I will start by uh, my – just so everything's clear, uh, the abortion thing is something that I have changed my position on. I mean, probably about like 10 years or so, I was, I wouldn't say I was staunchly pro choice, but I was definitely more that than anything. And I became pro life long before I, before I ever became a religious person, <laughs> just uh, for various, various reasons. I was coming from a very libertarian perspective. And in libertarian philosophy, this is a very much dividing issue, even among libertarians, of how do we think about how do we handle the idea of abortion. And, and it was by studying that and, and reading a lot of the pro-choice arguments um, and then the pro-life arguments in the kind of libertarian context mm-hmm. that my position began to began to change quite significantly. So on kind of like the pro-choice side, there were people like uh, Walter Block or, or Murray Rothbard. And then there was a uh, who, who I respected a lot for their uh, uh, economic analysis and, and thought there. But then when they got to the, the kind of uh, moral questions, this is a good example of good to great economists, but really bad moral philosophers mm-hmm. and, and not being persuaded and, and seeing the holes in their arguments when they were critiqued that I began to change my position on that uh, quite considerably. So, so I did become pro-life, you know, long before I, I became Catholic, mm-hmm. for example. Um, and it always kind of like affirmed to me is even though it was, it was, I would say it was like hesitantly pro-choice in the sense that, yeah, like it seems wrong, but to each their own was kind of my position, like coming very libertarian. Like I wouldn't do it, yep. but somebody else, if that's their problem, which is a common position. Very days, common. And that's, yeah. and that's why I had. So that's just my starting confession there. I mean, I, I think that that brings up a really good point, which is before you even get into the abortion debate, I think you should reflect, anybody should reflect on one, what they think like the parameters of law are, like when should there be laws restricting behaviors, what kind of behaviors and why. Mm-hmm. Just as a general, like that's a whole set. It's a uh, distinct discussion, but is Correct. clearly applicable to this, right? And then the other question is, what what is my view of morality? Mm-hmm. And like keeping those distinct, and then once you have good kind of cohesive views for each, or yes. like views that you kind of well thought of, or thought well about, then put them together and say, okay, what my moral view on abortion, euthanasia, any of these things. Is it the sort of moral uh, or immoral act that requires what I think the law should impose upon? Yeah. So just to reiterate what you're saying is first get clear on what your moral view of abortion is and then get clear on what you think the pragmatic view of it should be in, in the legal sense. And how clo- ultimately it's a question of how closely do you think the law should should ride morality? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So for example um, – you and I might agree that lying is wrong, but we don't want a law that enforces or that that penalizes me for lying to you yeah. about what I had for lunch. And and I would say that that was probably my pro-choice position before is I thought, yeah, yeah this, this seems wrong, but I don't think that there should be laws prohibiting it. Now, I've since right. changed my mind. I now yeah, think yeah. that this is a reasonable and responsible thing to outlaw for reasons we'll probably get into. Before that, why don't we uh, – why don't we drag Alex into the old thing here? So, so why don't you just say what, what, what your position is right now? We can discuss how you got there to begin with. Because maybe we don't even agree. I don't think we maybe even do fully agree on it at this point. Last week, we chatted about it. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really have a, a super – one of the things that I've worked on over the last few years is uh, suspending judgment on things that I feel like I don't know enough about or haven't read enough about to kind of avoid having – a. Super, uh, not even super emotional, but just 
uh, emotional attachments to hot button issues when I really just don't know much. And I, my immediate, well, I, one thing I will say is that my, I've always had, um, kind of a, a feeling of discomfort around the idea of abortion with uh, an acknowledgement that there might indeed be circumstances under which it would be a necessity. Now, I don't know enough about any of the circumstances under which, and I, you know, uh, overheard a conversation Pat was having yesterday about the topic and, and, you know, he agreed that there are indeed circumstances that in circumstances that even the Catholic church would agree, uh, would, uh, would allow for, for an abortion. I don't know any of the, any of the details. Um, I can say again, from a, from a personal standpoint, I've always been uneasy with the idea, but I think similar to where Pat found himself a number of years ago, um, it's kind of like discomfort without, um, while at the same time saying, you know, do we really need to have any sort of legal enforcement? But I've heard enough of um, the arguments uh, on both sides. And, uh, you know, one, again, that you were making yesterday in a conversation um, where I, I do have to say that, you know, my my apprehension to it certainly has been strengthened. Uh, and the jury's not out entirely for me, but I, again, not wanting to take a strong position that I can't really adequately back up. I can, I can tell you personally what I feel, but not intellectually, um, uh, like in the same way that you guys can, well, for sure. We'll see if we can convert Alex here then to the, uh, well, what, what about you as your, first off, what is the position? Uh, just, you know, I guess personally at first, before we get into any of the, the arguments for it, and then have you always held it? Yeah. Well, well just to say a little bit about what Alex said, I mean, that's like, a. I would love it if more people had the attitude of just, you know, I have apprehension about it and, or I am in support of abortion and I'm just not sure why that's my personal belief, but like there's more to learn about the situation. That's like a totally, mm -hmm. that's a good starting point. Not even starting point. That's, that's a middle point. That's, so that's, speak, what, you know? that's what Socrates would say is wise. Yeah. yeah that's not, yeah, not, yeah. not pretending not to know. Not, not like, pretending to know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and since this is like my 20th semester reading uh, Plato's Apology, I should know all about Socrates now at this, right, this yeah. point. So, yeah. But I mean, that's, I think that that's like a really fair point. And, and, and you know what? I think like in debates like, um, like abortion and like euthanasia, there's also this sort of view that you're either – that there's like two views, pro-life or pro-choice. But clearly there's you know a lot of variance among the views. So like you could have a view that um, – and this again is depending on your, what your moral reflections are in the moral aspect. You could have a view that it's uh, moral uh, to – or immoral to have an abortion um, – at certain periods of the pregnancy, but you would never want a law to, to, uh, restrict abortions mm -hmm. at any point of pregnancy. I mean, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. One of many possible views. Yeah. One of po many possible. And you could also have the view that, uh, not at the same time, but another person could have the view that, um, abortion is impermissible, gravely impermissible from conception forward. And given this, the, gravity of how immoral it is the law should have serious uh seriously control that mm -hmm. so i mean you can see how and then you can have every everywhere in between and beyond where um law should promote <coughs> abortion and it shouldn't be impermissible so there's like in other words what i'm trying to say is I don't like to get too caught up in you're either pro-life or pro-choice because there's a lot of nuanced thinking that goes into yeah, it. Yeah, we can evaluate structures. each of those positions independently. <laughs> yeah. And should. And yeah, should. exactly. So it's a, I mean, it's a long road for a lot of people. Yeah, well, we've got a long time for this episode. Yeah. So. <laughs> Six and a half hours so later. Grab a, grab a comfortable <laughs> seat, my friend. Um, so, my, I mean, my view overall, I would, if you had to take like the broad approach on pro-life mm -hmm. um, and based on my view the, of uh, respecting persons um, and that the fetus is a person and the rights of the fetus or the interests of the fetus um, are not outweighed by bodily rights. Yeah. And the gravity of that requires that the law, uh, given what is actually at stake, yeah. which is um, an innocent human life, mm -hmm. uh, that it's an appropriate time for there to be legal measures to prevent abortions. So, yeah. So yeah, I think our positions are 
Pretty similar? Right aligned. So why don't we start with considering it morally first, and then we can talk about yeah. how to think yeah, about yeah, it yeah. illegally. The one thing that changed my mind, and this Alex said about the argument that I gave yesterday, was just from a purely philosophical view, and again, coming from a pretty libertarian standpoint, and this is something that has undermined a number of libertarian positions for me uh, in general over the years. And I think this is a problem with various um, moral codes and, and how they tend to elevate one moral principle or one moral virtue that might be good in a certain context of relation, but they make it an absolute, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in the libertarian world, a number of thinkers there would, would make that something property rights, for example, like right. property rights and respect for property rights are the absolute and that was how a number of people would argue for abortion, that your right to your, your property uh, would allow you to eject any potential trespasser. That's how they would, would mm -hmm. often argue for, for the fetus. And to me, you know, thinking about it, there was, there was almost an, an immediate contradiction there in the sense that to even say that I respect somebody's property like, like, like Alex's property rights is to at least implicitly assume that I respect him as a person and value him as a person. Which means I respect his life. Mm -hmm. So to to respect his life, and then to take a position that could result in the extermination of life, if not an outright contradiction, is a severe intellectual tension that I, I was unable to reconcile. To, to even have the idea of property rights in respect to that already assume that I valued a person's life to right. begin with. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, one way people frame that is uh, property rights have, or the value of property depends on the value of the property owner. Mm -hmm. If the property owner didn't have value, then we wouldn't care about the property in the first place. So much more concise. That's why we bring so, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, and this, this is like a very, um, another way that people use a phrase, instrumental versus intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Things of instrumental value are good for some further end, are valuable for some further end, like money, for example. Money's not good in itself. You couldn't do anything with just money. Mm -hmm. You can burn it for fuel, but even that's for something else, right? Um, whereas things of intrinsic value, if you were to ask why is it good or why is it valuable, there's no further answer. You're just like, it is valuable. Mm -hmm. Some like common intrinsic values that people point to are pleasure, for example. If I'm like, why is it good for you to experience pleasure? There's no, it's hard to say a further answer. Just like, it has, it just is good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so going back to this idea of, of property versus property owners, you might frame it in terms of the property's instrumental value for something else. It's not just good in itself. Property is not just good, mm -hmm. but property owners, that's the thing that has intrinsic value in itself. So to just, you don't destroy th things with instrumental value for things with intrinsic value. You don't, or, or you don't, uh, other way, other way right, around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't destroy intrins things of intrinsic value for things with instrumental value because you're screwing up values at that point. Yeah. And that, that was it for me. That was the, that was, it was that argument that really made me start to, to shift my, again, yeah. I always thought there was something wrong with it, but that's where I had to let go of a sort of fresh part of my libertarian philosophy, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I had to shed that because I'm like, I can't, I can't rationally affirm this anymore and still be secure in my philosophical worldview. And this, I mean, a, a big part of this question too is, um, what counts as property because it, pregnancy is such a unique situation in nature where you have two living bodies. I mean, mm. just keep it super basic, you know, yep. um, two living bodies in, in a real, in, in a spatial relationship that where else do you see it really? You know, mm. like when are you going to have something else inside of you? Um, in that way. I mean, you like bacteria. Well, well you stuff, have, but like, and this is what the arguments would make in, in some of you coming from the pro choice on the libertarian side, which is common to people coming from pro choice from many different angles is that the child is a, they'll use terms like parasite yeah. and, and to kind of get to yeah, the yeah. point, like, where else do you see something like that? Well, in a parasitic relationship, yeah, then, yeah, then, yeah. It, then the question becomes, well, is this person, this fetus really a parasite or is it really a trespasser? For so example? you it, with the parasite thing, and I've heard that argument, what parasite is meant to capture is distinct species. Mm -hmm. And that's this is not a case of dis it's, distinct species. Mm -hmm. So, like, you're not even, if you're using parasite, you're not even going by. Yeah, I never, yeah, I, yeah, never I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a common thing you'll hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, or trespasser, if not parasite. Right. It's like but it's in there. Yeah. That to me, that just seems, <coughs> I couldn't really put into words why parasite didn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't ring true, but the whole species things makes perfect sense. The trespasser thing, it's the same thing. Like it, it like the baby didn't make the decision to end up in the womb. So it's like, regardless of what your feelings are to me, it only makes sense that saying trespasser is just a complete misnomer. Yeah. yeah. And that one never held any weight or force for me either, because if there's anything that a trespasser is about, it's about not being where you're supposed to be. And for me, if there's anywhere that a fetus is supposed to be, mm-hmm. it's right where nature put the fetus, which is in the womb. So it was, it was too disanalogous. Right. right. My whole thing when I was pro-choice was not on, I didn't think there was, and it was, it was by going through these and I was, these just aren't good arguments. Yeah. These aren't good arguments. And then just the seeing how I was elevating too high property rights over life. And and this is something in, in people getting a crash course in libertarian philosophy here. People will kind of in the libertarian world often take Locke's theory of of property, right? Which is the idea that you mix your labor with something mm-hmm. to acquire property. Uh, but then they'll never mention the previous part of why that's valuable, which according to Locke is because we have intrinsic value as human beings ultimately tied to God, right, is, is, is what Locke will say. So they'll kind of take it in a kind of like modern sense, the first half of, or the second half of mm-hmm. Locke's theory w- while lopping off the first part. And that to me was, was important because I was trying to actually get at the root of liberty. I'm like, why, like, why do we have a right to own property or why is owning property a good thing or why should we be able to own property? And some libertarians will just stop there. And they won't be able to answer that question, which that's not acceptable to me. Mm-hmm. But if you do want to answer that question, you have to affirm, affirm some type of intrinsic dignity to the human person. And then mm-hmm. how you ground that it is another question. Right. But as soon as you have that intrinsic dignity, as, as you said before, you have this, this intrinsic value, mm-hmm. then it's really hard to, um, to both rationally affirm that and, and be pro-choice. And it, it was for me anyways. That's why I had gave it up. And a lot of it, um, and this is kind of moving, moving around a bit, but, uh, so yeah, you, well, well, here's one element. We'll say we've identified one element of the, of the debate is how do, how does a mother and a, and a fetus relate? Mm-hmm. Like what is there is some people argue that, um, the fetus actually is a part of the mother's body in the same way that an organ is a part. Mm-hmm. Um, others say that it's a distinct entity, which if you just look at the, especially from, you know, there's. <laughs> It might be a little foggy in the first like few days of development, but it seems that most embryologists will say you have a distinct developing organism mm-hmm. from the very beginning. Um, and a lot of people confuse the debate about personhood with the debate about whether or not a fetus is alive. Mm-hmm. There's very little doubt the fetus is alive. You wouldn't need an abortion if it wasn't alive, if it wasn't developing. Correct. Um, but the debate about personhood is a debate about whether or not that living thing that's growing inside of the mother is a valuable thing. Mm -hmm. The thing that has a value that you and I have as persons presuming we have value as persons. So that's, that's what really gets into it. Yeah. So, I mean, two things here, I guess we are starting from the assumption that, that we do have value as persons. And I think almost everybody does affirm that no matter Mm -hmm. where you're coming from. If, if not, um, and we need, we'll do a separate episode for the nihilists after, if you've got trouble with that step. It's been a while. Trust me, we're happy to go there if we need to, but let's just start from (laughs) the position that almost everybody affirms, which is that humans do have some type of intrinsic moral worth. I think that's, that's fair. Cause I've, in all the times, I mean, unless like somebody is really squeezed in this position and they're just trying to find a way out, I've never really come across somebody who sincerely said that they just didn't think that that human persons had yeah. intrinsic moral uh, worth. And let's let's start with like when it, it's just to avoid the the controversies that come with human human being human person all these mm-hmm. things. Just say like you and I have some sort of worth that's you know the the three of us in, in this room right now have some sort of worth that's really, really important. I think the best way to understand it is intrinsic value. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, a, what about us is important? Why? And then does that trace back to uh, developing fetus? So um, one thing that was really helpful for me on this, I'll be interested to hear you because I haven't heard um, your argument for it yet, is actually 
uh, the scholastic distinction and Aquinas' uh, view of, you know, uh, not just Aquinas, it goes obviously back to Aristotle, of, of potentiality and actuality, mm. to understand that, you know, this, this actually is a person, even if it hasn't actualized all of its potentials as a person yet. And once you have the distinctions of potentiality and actuality, then you have the sort of philosophical framework or foundations you need to demonstrate, no, this this really is by its you know, inclusion in a human species, um, it is a person. It's it's actually a person, even if it hasn't actualized all of its potentialities yet. So just having that was was helpful for me in understanding. But but most people aren't coming from that tradition. So And they and they use it like so when we talk about potentiality now, mm-hmm. we especially if you're look if you're looking at like uh, Aquinas is um, five ways in the use of potentiality mm-hmm. and actuality and Aristotle's metaphysics and stuff like that. It's used a little bit different as, as a, as a sense of like uh, coming into being in itself rather Correct. than, rather than a lot of times when we talk about potential, when we talk about like organisms, we're talking about like the d- developmental span, the potentials mm-hmm. that they're realizing, the capacities that they're realizing across the course of a life. So some people, I mean, just to disambiguate that we could be meaning either of those things. Yep. But yeah, so uh, I, I, one of the ways to phrase that debate, um, is it a is a fetus a person with potential or a potential person? Mm-hmm. That's what that's one of the ways that people distinguish between the two. Concise, yet again. Thank, thank you, Professor. <laughs> this podcast professor is going to be oh, like 30 yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So obviously, um, if, you're, if you're going with the, the, the sort of uh, Thomist position on it, you would say it's, it's a person. Yeah, and we just manifest rationality rational. later. Well, we, you, do, you have manifest rationality later in life and maybe – so the, just to step back a little bit too, like what about us might be um, – valuable and here's kind of where i think you can really reflect on what your what your understanding of the value of you and me is by asking one you can look at the typical lifeline of like a human being and say at what point do we gain this value is it a a degree thing Mm -hmm. where you get a little more value as you say become more and you know um engage in society or whatever you want to ground it in. Or you peak in value, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're a little ahead of me because I'm a little ahead of yep. you in age. Uh, and and it, it, what qualities could we lose um, either in the natural process? So like everyone, you know, our mental f- uh, faculties decline later in life. Do we begin to lose value? Is our value independent of our ability to exercise um, faculties? Mm-hmm not only ability to exercise, but also the actual presence of the ability. So this is why like this, I mean, your view about this will affect your view of the value of like individuals with cognitive disabilities, et cetera. So you got to make sure like when you're navigating this question of what we, what our value depends upon, they are taking into account all the implications laterally and, you know. So maybe I can tighten this one up for one. <laughs> are you saying that either a person has value by what they are or they have value by what they can do? Yeah. Or what they, the qualities they have. Yeah. There's another way, you know, like, um, nice, nice to think. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I mean the, when we're into the, cause I think it's a fair, it's, it's, I think it's, the central question to the abortion debate is the value of the, the human the, or the, the thing at stake, the entity at stake, mm-hmm. which is a fetus and its relationship to us. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I think is core. Some people reframe it. For example, some arguments are um, that even if a fetus is a full person, it doesn't have a sort of a libertarian view. It doesn't have a right to be in mm-hmm. your body and um, stuff like that. But uh, I think that the, the, the core issue is going to be the value of the person. Correct. Even upon the assumption. Yeah. And when I was first um, digging into that, you know, my, my ultimate conclusion is there didn't seem to be a non-arbitrary principle, principled way to say this is where a person has value, whether that's at feeling pain or a heartbeat or uh, self-reflection mm-hmm. or degree of rash. They, they all seemed entirely arbitrary to me. And deeply problematic from a moral standpoint in that um, – or, or another one would be viability, for example. Yeah. Like So size, level of development, environment, or degree dependency, those all seemed incredibly arbitrary to mm-hmm. me and, and 
that we could just as easily apply those to countless situations outside of the womb as well as inside. Mm -hmm. So this began to just draw me closer and and, and closer back and say, no, I I think people really, if they have value at all, they have to have value by what they are rather than anything that they, Mm -hmm. they can do. Um, and that's a really important, I mean, for like the people that are, are, uh, on the fence. And I, I mean, when I say on the fence, like Alex, you're like, you know, very on the fence, even as a bioethicist, I'm open to like, you know, I, I read a lot of arguments on these things. I'm open to, I'm on the fence too. Everyone's on the fence, you know, like you should be on the fence at all times in a sense. Um, but I think that you should always be reflecting on this question that what you're bringing up is where does our value, value lie? Does it rely on the sort of the thing we are as opposed to what we can do and what we you know look like, all that stuff? That's going to be core to almost any ethical issue. And it's yeah. super important about, or to abortion. Did you want to add something, Alex? And I just like randomly handed in the microphone because I was going <laughs> to I was going to cough here. But he is, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like maybe, you know, like saying always reflect, I think it's always good to reflect if nothing else for an intellectual exercise. But I guess my position is such now that, um, and then it goes back to the ontological question, because if you just think that, um, like, I don't know if I could sustain this from a purely humanist standpoint, for example, I don't think I could. I think that there needs to be something, um, transcendent, whatever. We don't, mm-hmm. we don't have to make a particular religious commitment, but we have to, you know, for us to have objective moral value. And the mm-hmm. term objective, I think, is even more useful than intrinsic in this sense, meaning that our value is wholly independent of our opinion of that value, mm-hmm. that we are really and truly valuable, independent of what anybody thinks about it. Yeah. Then we can't, we can't find that anywhere in the physical universe. We just can't. Yeah. Um, it's not a physical thing. It's not a Value physical thing. It's, it's, not, it's not a physical thing. So it ultimately becomes a, a question of transcendence uh, and your general metaphysical worldview. Now, if that's the case, right, and you know we're both Catholic here, Alex is Jewish, and you think that human beings really do have objective moral worth given to them made in the image of God, so to speak. And some people are like, well, we can't accept a theological argument, a philosophical debate. Oh, why not? Why not? Right. Philosophy is what gets you to theology. We were just, we were just talking about that. And we got to, and if we think that humans have objective moral worth, we have to ground that somewhere. Mm-hmm. We have to explain that somehow. It's not acceptable for me to just leave that a question mark. Say, no, I think they do, but that's it. That, like, that, the, and like, if you can't answer that and you're on a humanist, that, I would just think that that's just an illusion. They don't actually. And then I would probably would be like a Peter Singer or somebody like that mm-hmm. and just think like, well, whatever society decides on is, is whatever it decides on. But if you do hold the view that at least I do now that we have this objective moral worth, and I don't, I don't think it's something that you go back and revisit and think about in terms of personhood, for mm-hmm. example. Like I, I'm solidly convinced that we have objective moral worth that is not dependent on our philosophizing at this point, even though philosophy helped to get me to that position. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's now susceptible to philosophy in that regard. So I think the point you're, I think the point you're making, which is it's a feature of, uh, of intrinsic value, which is it's not up to what we think it is. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's not um, susceptible to our perceptions as you're saying. So uh, to, to put it another way is even if you think, that you're not worth anything if you're going through a hard time or something, Mm -hmm. it doesn't actually matter. (laughs) Here's another depressing fact of your life, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's not about you. It's not about you. Your life is not about you. You don't determine for, for people with this view of the view that I have and that you have, and I'm Mm -hmm. Alex and we'll, uh, whatever. (laughs) See what, Say he's later. Jewish, but he's actually somehow a nihilist. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I no, I hold that same view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the one that Pat just described to me. I won. I mean, the one that you guys were <laughs> right, saying. Right. But it, the idea is that um, our value is independent of our perception of our own value. So if I'm having a bad day or a bad year or a bad month, and I think I'm worthless, I'm not actually worthless. And that's, I mean, that's how you actually get. Um, the wrongness of suicide off the ground, Mm -hmm. I think, because even if you want to destroy you, you're still a thing of value. And if you destroy a thing of value, you're doing something wrong. Correct. And, and even if it's kind of the same thing, right? Cause you said, uh, uh, Pat spilled, I spilled my coffee. I think I'm just going to end it. Um, 
I'd be like, like for me to say, you know what, Peter, I value your opinion. Go ahead is the same type of contradiction. Right. I only value your opinion because I value you. Right. So how can I then value you to go destroy the thing of value? Yep. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this is again, the sort of instrumental and intrinsic thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Peter gets very sensitive over his coffee. So yeah, I know. Do not, (laughs) but But it's, uh, yeah. So, and another thing is, um, with this idea of what your worth is or what the ind- what an individual human being's worth is, is it's not up to, if we all decide that Alex is invaluable today, it's not up to us either. Uh-huh. So it's not a matter of majority. It's not a matter of any of these things. It just is what it is. And, and it's not up to anything. And, and then the next question is what, what about us does a track? And then we're back to, is it the things we do? This is the thing the what we are. Yeah. Our nature so like to say that something is, you know, objectively the case is not to say that it's universally the case. And I think that that's where people get mixed up is if our position is correct and that, um, say that it's, you know, humans do have objective moral value by what, what they are, not what they can do. Um, and then just put abortion aside for now and just think of it in terms of murder of anybody, right. Or the example that's commonly and cliche used is the, uh, the Holocaust, right. Is that, if that was objectively morally wrong, even if the Nazis won World War II and killed off everybody or brainwashed everybody else who thought that it was wrong and convinced them all it was right, would it still it have been still wrong? Be wrong. Yeah, it yeah. still have been wrong, even if it was universally held. Well, it's the same thing with – even though there's disagreement over the moral issue, doesn't mean that there isn't a right answer to right. it. And that's the thing is, again, I think most people, almost everybody, by natural moral intuition, understands the ob- objective moral worth of human beings – where the confusion comes in is a disagreement over the moral facts, right? So it's not – we're not relativistic in this sense. I think that's a, a wrong way of seeing it. We we are perceiving pretty much the same moral reality, but there's a, a, a blurriness over the particular moral facts. Is this a person or is it not? And we've seen this over over time many times. I hate to bring this up and compare it to this, but I think it's similar. Slavery, the Holocaust, where these people – they do affirm objective moral value in humans. They just say, um, well, if you're a different skin color, you're actually not a person. You're not somebody I need to value. Or if you're a different race or if you're from a different country. So, you see, so again, either you have to be willing to go all the way with it and say, no, human by what they are or objective moral value. But it means you can't discriminate on race, ethnicity, geographical location, size, level, to whatever, or you're going to be in these kind of like morally confused states over specific little details where then I don't think you can make a principal distinction anymore. So the, what the pushback that I usually get is one expanding the other way where like, why not, uh, what differentiates human beings from other things? So why is this not speciesism? Um, Right. You and want, then, yeah. I, um, because I don't think that other uh, species have the same objective moral worth as we do. And what would ground it is what people would say. I think that that's ultimately a theological question. I, I do. I think it is. I think that if humans have objective moral worth, it comes. It has to come from something transcendent. And you can make that argument philosophically to an extent, but it's so, you can make the argument philosophically that you have the rational grounds to move into theology. Let's say that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can complete it philosophically. Mm-hmm. I mean, you tell me. Well, I mean, it's – Value, value theory is just really complex for this reason, which is what would it even mean to prove something has value? Mm-hmm. Like the, what, it, what counts as a proof? If I want to prove to you that that statue out there is, is made of marble, we can go out and actually test the marble. And it's like an empirical thing. And that's what, what, what like, if you talk to anybody in this day of age, um, about what a proof is, that's like what comes to mind. Or you have like deductive proofs and things like that. But value is, there's always going to be some sort of, uh, you have to start from some basic assumptions. It doesn't mean they're merely assumptions. Mm -hmm. It just means that they're starting points. Yeah. And then you build off those. And I think, uh, but I think you bring up a good point because I know some people will try to make the the humans and try to avoid speciesism by saying, "Well, we're rational or we we're moral agents." Yeah. But that that to me is going to depend on your overall metaphysics because I don't see any reason to think that just because we are slightly more evolved primates without any intention, design, or purpose behind mm-hmm. it, I don't see why that still wouldn't be speciesism. Mm-hmm. 
And I mean, you always get into that. Basically, if if someone says, well, what matters is when you're conscious, Mm -hmm. then of course you have the question of why. Yep. Why does consciousness matter? Active consciousness, right? Um, or what matters is a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Why does a heartbeat matter? What matters is feeling pleasure and pain. Why does that matter? If if the so like the pleasure and pain one, I think it was actually just referred to yesterday in the mm-hmm. State of the Union. Um, some abortion laws track when a fetus can begin to feel uh, pleasure and pain. Yeah, but feeling <laughs> pleasure and pain wouldn't, and this kind of goes back to the thing, the value of that grounds and the value of the thing feeling pleasure and pain in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, a little trickier one because we also seem to think that pain and pleasure have intrinsic value in themselves. Yeah. Um, but does it ground in the entity that bears the, the pleasure? Well, I think that the, the fruit that can come out of this abortion thing, if you're really trying to work this out, is it can cause you to consider the theological or the religious points of view that you may not have considered before. Yeah, as, totally. I, as I had yeah, to, yeah, yeah. as I had to, because I'm like, no, I, I like, I know as sure as I know anything that if anything is wrong, raping, torturing, and murdering an innocent child is wrong. Like, yeah. I don't care what anybody thinks exactly. About yeah, yeah. That. What are the grounds for that? Mm-hmm. Right. What are the grounds for this this deep moral intuition that seems as real to me? And I think it is for most anybody. I would sooner I would sooner think I was hallucinating you than thinking that that was really wrong. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Like, yeah, yeah. And I have I have no reason to doubt the sense that you're really there. So why should I doubt my moral intuition? Why does that seem? Why would that be so utterly defeasible? But my other senses seem reliable. And then it, that ultimately, I think, will come down of whether you think only physical things exist again. Mm-hmm. And then I think you will have to search around and ask yourself, are humans, are we really special in some objectively true way? And if so, what does that mean? I think philosophy, again, can take you so far. Mm-hmm. It can. It, it is the handmaid to, to theology. But if yeah. you really want to be able to support this position through and through, that's why I get somewhat frustrated with kind of modern secular philosophy is it, it's so, to me, arbitrarily separated the philosophical and the theological. I think that's why modern secular philosophers are often pretty frustrated too. They don't get anywhere. They go in circles. It's it's a hard, it's, you get at these endpoints that are pretty difficult to overcome. And I mean, I think a lot, a lot of people will tell you if you have, I think a good view of the, the limits of philosophy, Mm -hmm. then which, um, you know, I, I, hope that philosophers do and just anybody like what can philosophy tell us what can it tell us yeah then there are there are endpoints to philosophy that that don't course or that they can't answer some of the most important questions in life which is yeah. what aquinas was saying too yeah know? and and like same thing with science too and 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 theology like each of these disciplines has their their purpose just know what each can do yeah and know yeah. what each can do and yeah. understand how one translates and can support and lead to the other mm-hmm. but not trying to stretch one beyond what it is actually capable of right. so I guess I don't really make apologies from moving from philosophy to theology at a certain point yeah yeah and you don't have to and yeah. and I think it's um you know either some people choose to just turn around rather than go into theology and that's, but at least you're aware of like, what are the limits of, what are the limits of these questions? Like what, and asking yourself, and I think we've had a good conversation now about like, if, if you, um, approach an abortion debate, like thinking about these things, Mm -hmm. then that's, that's more than most people will do. And, you know, about almost any topic really. And, and the other nice thing is the things we have talked about, Mm -hmm extend to like most other ethical yeah. issues. Well, I mean, morality and to say morality was what really did in large part cause me to reconsider the religious worldview. Yeah, it's interesting. Re- yeah. To reconsider. I'm not surprised at all, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it did. Um, and that specifically led me into to natural law. I'm like, oh man, I think these guys actually got it right. I, I, I really yeah. do. And like, there's, there's something here that I didn't consider anymore. And then I got obsessed with natural theology and arguments for God. And like that gives you all the, the rational grounds you then need mm-hmm. to move to theology, uh, which to me not would only seem, you know, acceptable, but would be the responsible thing to do mm-hmm. at that point. It, it is, uh, I, I think really that that's how you do, especially if you want to affirm the basic intuition that we all have that human beings are 
valuable. And, pe- and this is a very basic, and like every, this is a yeah. belief that's occasioned in everybody. You can be trained out of it through philosophy. Like yeah, you, can yeah, be, yeah. you can be indoctrinated into anything, but this is a, this is a properly basic belief. And I, I think especially for the um, abortion debate, for other debates, you can do other, you know, test other periods of someone's life. But a, a important question people should ask themselves when, um, when considering what they think the moral status of, of a fetus slash whatever there's actually like a million terms i'm just using fetus because that's like the almost neutral one yeah um is what do you think the moral value of the just born or like almost all the way out baby is yeah which is what is like so alarming to me about some of these these new laws that are being passed most recently in in new york um, it's, it's incredible to, to me. And like, th- it's incredible that they're getting through because they are severely against polling. Like most people are not at all, even close to being in favor of, of mm-hmm. late term or partial birth abortion. Yeah. And I think once you get that close to seeing and you, you witness it, I mean, one of the things that really changed my mind utterly, like, some people think that it's inappropriate to do these things, but was actually seeing a late term abortion. Oof. It was the most, somebody put a video online and it was like, one of the most horrifying things I have yeah, ever horrible. seen in yeah. my life. It really was. I've purposely not. Don't don't do it. Like honestly, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. honest to God, do like never see that. It yeah. is an image that is burned into my mind. Yeah, that I will never be able to remove. But like that just sealed my conviction. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, I, this is an evil thing. It is a wrong thing. Mm. Um, and just and we were talking about this before. I know there's there might be some listeners that are like, what are three guys doing talking about abortion? It's not a guys only debate or a women only debate at all. I mean, one, you could you could flip it around and just say if if how would you feel about the arguments presented if we were three women? And I and if you want to hear a woman present these arguments, there are many out there that will do it. Yeah, if that makes a difference to you. Mm-hmm. So this is not a an issue in that sense. Plus, um, as a we were all former fetuses, so we have some stake in the game. As a former fetus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I, I just don't – like I know that some people will want to dismiss what we're saying just because we're guys talking about what is – quote unquote, a woman's issue, but it's really not. Yeah. And I, I, as I told you, I've been having, we'll call them discussions with various people online. And that's, that is a typical response is, uh, you know, uh, what are two, two white males had to bring race into it too, talking about this. And it's, it's, that's an ad, that's just an ad hominem. Mm -hmm. So either my, the arguments have force or they don't, it doesn't matter who they're coming from. So I like your example. How would you feel if they were coming from three women? I can easily get three women. Exactly. I know the argument of women who, if you need, yeah. Who have the same exact view. So it's not a Mm -hmm. gender of race. So we kind of, we kind of, you know, uh, glance over a bit, but I, you know, I think again, it's talking about value by what it, what a person is or what a human is versus what they can do. But what are, what are some ways that, that you think about it from a, from. Well, I mean, so, yeah. So the, I mean, one of the things that I think is important is one testing, um, testing that idea of what quality, like what you were, like what you could become. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, I give a, I'll give a, a sort of little like quiz in the beginning of, um, the abortion section or not, not really the abortion section, like the section that depends on, personal identity. And I ask questions like, uh, if you, um, lost your arms, would you still be you? And would you have the same value that you have now? All this stuff. If you, uh, when you were six days old from birth, did you the same value you have now? Are you the same person you have now? These sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And that kind of starts to sort through. And like, if you went, were in a permanent vegetative state, would you have the same value? Would you be the same person? So those two sort of things. And that kind of helps people sort through what their intuitions are and also trying to maintain consistency between their views. And if they do say, you know, um, a mindless fetus does not have value, but a person in a, a persistent vegetative state does have value, figuring out how to sort through those discrepancies. Mm-hmm. Like they seem to be similar. If, if they're not, why aren't they? So that's how I like to get people to think about the yeah. question of personhood and value. And yeah. then, and then, the, and then separately the legal thing, like, okay, now depending on why you think abortion is wrong, that's going to determine whether you think it's appropriate to have laws 
restrict yeah. or advance abortion rights. So before we hop into that, I, I will simply say that there's a number of arguments on both sides, but I'll focus, since we're coming from a pro-life perspective, I'll say that these are definitely arguments that I don't like. One of them is that, well, you may have, a, a, you've probably heard this one, it annoys me every time I hear it. Well, what if you aborted the next Mozart or the guy again? And I don't like that because it, it tends to say they're like, oh, just because some guy was a great pianist, he or she has more value. Yeah. There's a lot of really bad pro-life arguments. Too. Yeah. I, agree with that. I mean, this yeah. is, there's any bad arguments for right. anything. So yeah, yeah. Uh, again, either you have value by what you are or what you can do, because right. that's just affirming the what you can mm-hmm. do thing, which is hugely problematic. That's mm-hmm. exactly what we're not trying to say. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you is the, the next Mozart or just, you know, somebody who, you know, has various disabilities and it, like the value is either there, it's really there or it's not. Yeah. And I mean, I would say like we're in, in a, podcast talking about abortion with pe- three people who are uh, against abortion. Um, and even if you're against abortion like us, you should be reflecting on why you're against abortion because the strength of the argument really matters. And if you think it's because, like you said, the risk of a- aborting a Mozart is high, then think about all the implications that you're placing the value in what someone can do as opposed to what they are. Yeah. So that's... Um, that's and it's, good it's always say. unfortunate because it's, 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 especially on the popular level, it's usually the worst arguments that come out of the gate. We were talking before, we don't even, I don't even argue <laughs> on social media because it's such a mess, but. So, you reason. know, no matter where you're coming from <clears throat> listening to this, I hope that you will at least be able to say that, okay, that was a fair discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's what I was trying to, you know, at least stimulate the, the sort of questions you should be asking before, um, you know, in the process of coming to a level of certainty about, okay. about abortion. So now let's, now let's just make as our starting point. Okay. I'm, I'm pro-life from a moral perspective. Yeah. So then how do you go from the moral to the legal? So, uh, pro-life from, let's be sp- so specifically, let's say I'm pro-life because I think that destroying a fetus is as gravely as a moral is destroying you. Yeah. Um, and then I also think that one of the functions of the law is to protect innocent human beings from violence and destruction. Mm-hmm. So you put those pieces together. And have, it just snaps right there. Yeah. 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 And that's I mean, where um, I, I'm with you right there. It's, it's reasonable and responsible for societies to have certain laws. Yeah such as the protection of, of innocent life. Yeah. I mean, like if there's any fundamental law that a reasonable, responsible society has, it's that. And let's, uh, kind of put another argument away quickly, which is that, um, abortion should be legalized because then it's safer, mm-hmm. but there's that, that principle wouldn't hold for a million reasons. We don't allow, like take any immoral act, harvesting, uh, organs from little kids on the street. Mm-hmm. We don't then legalize it because we want it done in a safer method. Mm-hmm. It's wrong. Legalizing it for safety doesn't, yeah. Isn't something you want to do for all these things, right? So I think that that's important too, because people who don't often reflect or get, you know, examine their conscience or, or what morality is often will take moral signals from the legal system. Yeah. yeah They'll yeah. look at it and be like, oh, it's legal. So, I mean, I'll never forget in my first philosophy class all those years ago, how many people were surprised by the question, is something moral just because it's legal or vice versa? Yeah. Like they never thought of it. Yeah, yeah. They just assumed that because it was legal, it was moral. So I think that there's great a great many number of, 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 of opportunities to educate, to provide a moral education. It's certainly not a sufficient moral education, but a moral reflection through the legal system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's good. I mean, that question in itself is a great question to um, kind of frame your beliefs uh, dividing things into moral and legal terms. Yeah. And worrying first about, well, you can worry about whichever one you want first, but <laughs> worrying about them separately and then seeing how they fit together. Cause that's super important. Yeah. And to be, and to be, uh, Alex is, <laughs> we're going to get you in here. Don't worry, man. Um, I'm still very much libertarian on a lot of positions. There's a number of things that I think, okay, yeah, that that's immoral, but it would be impractical or have a, a greater negative effect if we tried to outlaw it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not like anything that doesn't adhere to Pat Flynn's, or to natural law theory, for example, I think should be strictly verboten. I think that the moral law needs to be close enough or tight enough to the natural law to to not encourage bad behavior or worse behavior if it's violated, which is obviously like if you made – if you tried to punish lying 
with 20 years in prison, right? Somebody slips up, they, they tell a lie. Well, then they might go really far now to avoid spending life in prison, right? They yeah, might murder yeah. somebody, right? <laughs> right? So like there's that. You have to consider these these pragmatic – and that's, that's a hard question is like how closely should um, – the legal system ride against if we're going off of natural law, natural law. I think yeah. it should be right up against the, the protection of life. Like there's, there's yeah, no I question think that's, that for me there. Yeah, yeah. And then it kind of will expand out or create more leniency on various issues from that. It's also totally uh, another like sub question about what sort of penalties should be incurred, all that stuff, to- incarcerate, all that stuff is totally separate, but you can have an idea of, um, not totally separate, obviously it's related, but you, mm-hmm. you can have idea that, you know, I think the law should intercede. How the law intercedes is another question. Yeah. So, um, you know, people might say, go, going back to abortion, even if abortion is gravely immoral and illegal, what are, should women be penalized when they, like, what should be the punishment for abortion? Yeah. Should it be the equivalent of, uh, first degree murder? on the street or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't have currently have anything to say on that, but that's yeah. the sort of questions that you would ask. Now, I don't think it should be. Now probably, let's, but. let's be fair and, and consider some of uh, what I think are fair objections, even if they're somewhat misleading because they're such a minority of cases We call them the hard cases. Right. Yeah. And I, I the first thing I would want to say is that the pro-life position, I think this is a common misunderstanding is it's not just pro-life for the baby. It's, it's pro-life for the mother yes, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like pro-life for every human Party person involved, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. the way through. So it's not just because that you're pro-life, that you value life, the baby, that you somehow don't value the life of the mother. That would be, yeah. um, that would be missing it. And as Alex said that, you know, not only does the Catholic church, uh, willing to consider hard cases and I bring mm-hmm. them up, not just because we're Catholic, because it's often associated with one of the most pro-life institutions out right. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even the national, um, right to life committee, you know, says, mm-hmm. no, there's, there's hard cases where exceptions are made. I think it's important for you to explore those details because those exceptions don't necessarily involve actively killing so yeah. much as focusing on saving, saving the, the life mother. of the mother. So, would you yeah. mind? Yeah. Uh, so, um, for example, with the topic pregnancies, which, pose a danger to the mother's life. There are uh, methods that the that are permitted by the Catholic Church where the intention is to save the mother's life mm-hmm. and it puts the um, embryo at risk because the embryo can no longer develop it in the mother. So the intention is not to to kill the embryo. Yeah. The intention is to save the mother and it puts I mean it's a the the danger is fatal to the um <coughs> to the embryo, but the, it's all based on the doctrine of double effect. And um, one analogy that I think is, is useful for situations like that is, is the difference between two people who are out drowning in the sea, right? Maybe you've heard this one before. What you're talking about is I, I'm going to save person A, and by doing that, person B is probably going to die. And mm-hmm. I know that, but I have to make a choice, and I'm saving person A. Right. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the abortion would be, okay, I'm going to save person A, but on my way to save person A, I'm going to shoot person B. Yeah, you can't, you can't intend the, the yeah. killing of the other person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, th- these are just really, really unfortunate circumstances mm-hmm. that um, people wish didn't happen, but you can navigate through ethically and retain a coherent view. Yeah. Which I think is important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally. think people sometimes don't think that that's a possibility, but it is. You yeah. Can, yeah. Can it's definitely a possibility. Consider. And there's a lot of interesting literature on that too. Um, I mean, there's, you know, of course you can question double effect, all that stuff. There's, if you're interested in this stuff, there's plenty to read, et cetera. But um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't, you don't want to, if you are um, in support of abortion, you don't want to pull out the straw man that, you know, pro life people want to, kill mothers to save babies or something like that. That's, um, or kill, yeah. Kill mothers to save babies or something like that. Cause there's, that's not the general pro-life position. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a valuing of, of life objectively <clears throat> on, on every, on every level. So, um, all right, Alex, you just listened to us gab on about this topic for almost an hour now. Where does, where, where do you stand? <laughs> I mean, rel- relative to what I uh, offered earlier, yeah, I mean, I think uh, an hour's worth of conversation is uh, like like a brick in the structure that helps you to to uh, nice. come up with intelligent um, <laughs> uh, intelligent and informed views on things. And so, uh, I think you guys present very good arguments. I'm not familiar enough with the uh, arguments of the uh, pro-choice side 
to say. But again, like I said, you know, my emotional um, push is in the direction of uh, pro-life yeah. and really limiting abortion as much as possible. Um, but I think you guys have covered it quite well. I mean, particularly with uh, the fact that there are indeed exceptions. This is not like a black and white absolute. It's uh, uh, being guided by certain moral principles that uh, we're all bound to mm -hmm. and uh, and finding out how best to exercise those principles in uh, in light of very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think my position is still uh, relatively, <laughs> probably more or less the same because, um, again, you know, this is like one and I'm sure a series of conversations. Um, but for me, I just need to get more educated. Yeah, and I mean it in, the, in like the honest sense, not like what you hear a lot of people say like, oh, I need to be more educated, which really what they mean is like re-educated so that they don't offend anybody and they know like the right word. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. exactly. So, yeah. Um, no, and I, I mean that genuinely for sure. But I think, yeah, it's been a very, uh, very interesting conversation. You guys know significant amount of the topic. I'm, uh, uh, Thanks. I'm not there yet. Yeah, <laughs> very welcome. Checks in the mail, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> no, I, it's look. I, I, part of the reason I want to talk about it is because I do have an emotional investment in this now. I yeah, really, it's I a really, very emotional I, issue. It is. It is. And um, uh, so I don't want to act like um, emotionally objective. Uh, I'm not on this anymore. Uh, but you can be you can be emotionally biased and still rationally objective on things. I don't think that mm. people realize that that's a possibility. And there was a point on this issue, which is important, where I wasn't emotionally biased in this, really. Like, I had a little intuition. I thought it was kind of wrong, but I didn't have, like, a real emotional attachment to the other side. But I was still able to – it was through being rationally objective through it and changing my mind that I then became emotionally biased yeah. in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sometimes that's the, the – Order it happens. Yeah. You know? So it is upsetting to me when I see these laws being passed in New York and, and things like that. So yeah. whether you agree with me or not, I hope you can understand where I'm coming from of wanting to actually just open the conversation yeah. and talk. And about with it. these kind of talking points, like to, I mean, it would be good to find people who are like willing to talk about these things with like some intellectual honesty or just like, intellectual humility or something like Alex, like you're, you know, you're genuinely open to learning more about these different points and like talking them over and, and moving through. Yeah. There's a lot going on with these things. There's questions of, uh, metaphysics of persons, questions of value, questions Correct. of property rights, if property is a thing, what is property questions of bodily rights. That's usually how it's, um, described in, in like the kind of classic, uh, the right to your body. Um, and so just figuring all these things out, that's why it's such a perpetually interesting and important conversation is because so many different moral features hinge on this one topic. Yeah, it does. It's, it's like I said, I hope that there's opportunity in that for people who do dig in deeper. And I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, even though this has become a very political issue, I really like wish it wasn't, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like whether you're on the left or right or Democrat, Republican, conservative, libertarian, like this is, um, it doesn't need to be something like you don't need to assume a position on abortion just because of a, a party affiliation. Yeah. Makes this no, that makes no sense to me at all. Uh, uh, this is always like confused me so much how these party lines have been drawn up that, that because you're like, whatever, take like a fiscal view that you might have based on a uh, party line. You also have views on abortion. You also What's have views on like, what are the connections yeah, between these right. issues? But people feel like they have to be in a team, you know? So they grab all the issues that come with being a Democrat or Republican. It's like yeah. totally nuts to me. And I guess like that's, that's the thing now is like, you know, being Catholic. And if you want to know my political views, just open a catechism ultimately. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you'll realize that that doesn't quite match up with any political party yeah, totally. at all. Um, so, you know, there'd be some things on, on the, on the sort of Republican side that would fall in line. It'd be some things on the Democrat side that would, that would fall in line. Yeah. And uh, so that's it. You know, people hear abortion, they immediately start to think party affiliation. And I would just say, I would caution that strongly for the reasons that you just said, it's yeah. just because you come in on one issue doesn't mean you have to assume every other issue that that party, right. the stance that yeah. party takes. These are things that should be thought through independently. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, it's, um, yeah, it's it's a really unfortunate sort of state that 
state of of uh politics that we're in that that's i mean i guess i'm sure it happens in many other places for the oh. same reasons but it's just yeah it's kind of a, it is an extra layer of sorting through to like get anywhere mm-hmm. with it so well, is what prof- it is professor coke thank you for the stimulating conversation yeah it's been good thank you guys thank you alex thank you <laughs> We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.